Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Woo! I'm so excited that you guys are here, and I am so excited to be um, have this opportunity to just speak to you guys today. Um, I come from a long line of storytellers in my family. Like, I was raised in a family of storytellers. And I don't know um, if that's because... I think there's a few reasons. Probably one is because we spent so much time, like, out uh, working on the the ranch. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of time spent in the, uh, <laughs> like, driving a tractor. And um, there was a lot of storytelling that time that happens on there. And also not having a television growing up, there was a lot of time to just be able to sit and tell stories. And my Uncle Strand is probably the best storyteller of all of us. He could tell, he has told some tall tales. Like uh, one of the, one of the legendary one that, you know, like I couldn't wait for him to tell to my boys is about the mean mama coyote that's out there on my grandparents' ranch that, you know, runs, runs around and all the children are terrified of. There's been many stories about the mean mama coyote. Um, and, you know, even one time when he convinced me that he was uh, an alien that had been given to my grandparents, I mean, it was, you know, I really believed him. That was a long day on the tractor, I will tell you. Um, and some of the stories, it doesn't have to be like a made-up story. Some of the stories are real stories of our family's heritage. Um, it's not unusual at all when my family's together for people to take turns standing up on the fireplace and telling a story. And my favorite one, I actually videoed um, my grandmother and her half-sister telling the story of their grandmother, okay, when she met their grandfather. And she was um, a, a, a from the Cherokee tribe of the First Nations people down um, around Texas. And she was the chief's daughter. And they tell this story about how she rode into the trading post. She had her own horse, and she was whipping that horse. And her hair was long and black and fabulous and flowing out behind her. And when she came up to the trading post, she stopped really fast, and the, and the dust was all around. And then who would become her husband, who was sort of like the town mayor's son, okay? Um, he was standing there at the trading post, and the dust sort of settled all over him and he saw her <laughs> and that was it they had this um, amazing and uh, scandalous and tumultuous relationship um, and they we are referred to as Ma and Pa Bell which isn't near as exciting as the story about how they met <laughs> Ma and Pa Bell anyway that's my great well, that would be my great great grandparents and I love to hear those stories um, I love a good story do you like a good story well this book that I'm going to talk about today is a great story that God has chosen to put in his word so that we know that it's true we believe that the Bible is God breathed and it is um, that it is his love letter to us it's how he tells us who we are um, in context of the world as a whole. And this book is the eighth book of the Bible. And the first seven books, you know, there's a lot of great information. Some of them, um, there's, there's great stories. But this book is a small book, um, and it is a narrative about two women. And it's called the Book of Ruth, okay? It's only four chapters long, and it tells one of the most impactful and powerful stories that echoes through all the rest of the Bible about God's redeeming love for us and how he comes to us in the middle of our darkest and, and most despairing situations and makes a way for us to be a part of his beautiful plan that he has for our lives. Do you guys want to hear it? Okay, so I'm going to tell you part of it, but I'm going to skip over some stuff. I told Chris when he asked me if I was ready to preach today, um, that I had six hours worth of material, and <laughs> he said that you guys didn't mind it to stay for six hours. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. So anyway, I've cut down four hours and 40 minutes, or five hours. I can't do any math. Whatever. You know what I'm saying. Um, and 
Um, so I'm going to skip over some parts of it and encourage you to read the book of Ruth this week. It's four chapters. Read it all in one sitting, okay? And read it a few times. Like, read it every day this week, all four chapters. And just ask God to teach you something new about your story and about how it's intertwining with his story um, in the context of what he did for Ruth and Naomi. And I think it will be amazing. I've studied this book during great times in my life, and I've studied this book during very difficult times times in my life and it's been a comfort on both sides of those things the first time that I really studied it was about nine years ago and uh, I went um, I was just asking God to make sense of a situation that I was in um, where I had lost my best friend I know I've talked to you guys about that before she died of kidney cancer um, a really horrible and awful um, disease and I was so angry at God and I was really wrestling through that And so I turned to the book of Ruth, and I read it over and over again, and I journaled about it. And it was through this book that God really showed me um, some powerful things um, about women specifically and about um, dealing with very difficult situations and circumstances. Um, First, I want to tell you about Ruth that is one of the things that's so great about it is how countercultural that this was in the patriarchal society that they lived in when this was written. This is just unheard of that the title of this book would be a woman's name. That's hard for us to understand because as women, I mean, we're still, um, uh, there are still some things that need to change, but for the most part, compared to what it used to be, um, women were just, did not have the same value on their lives as men and everything that god did um brought about uh was was about raising up and about empowering women and i hope that i will point out a few of those things um from that today so that you'll you'll be able to see that even in a culture that didn't value women that they didn't have any kind of rights that god has always and will always continue to um Uh, remind us that we are as women created in the image of God as a matter of fact a really important thing to understand um, when we think about women um, I think sometimes um, in church we have this um, idea of a certain standard or way that that women should be but there's um, if we look at Genesis 2 um, when God has created Adam right after that He created Eve, right? He said it wasn't good for man to be alone, and it said, I want to make a helper suitable for him, right? So that word helper, yeah, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. The word helper is not a great translation for that word because um, if we look at uh, the, the commentaries and the original meaning of that word in the Hebrew, it's called azer. So it's E-Z-E-R, Azer. And that word um, that they translate as helper is a military term, okay? It is used um, of God when it talks about how God um, is an Azer to us, okay? In sort of a way that it's a military term. God created Eve to be this Azer. It's a, a warrior, a warrior partner alongside Adam. And she was advancing God's kingdom throughout the earth. And this, do not miss this, women. This is every woman's calling. This is who we are meant to be, an Azer warrior. That's regardless of our age, however young, however old. That's regardless of our uh, marital status. That doesn't matter whether or not we have children. Um, Whatever circumstances we find ourselves in, God has made us all to be Azer warriors. Every woman is an Azer from birth to death, and we are warriors for God's purposes. I think that's super important in understanding the context of this story of how God created woman and how he intends um, for Ruth and Naomi to live and how he intends for us to to live in our lives and what we what we bring to the table when we come into the room okay are you with me okay so um Ruth Ruth um and her her mother-in-law Naomi 
are introduced at the beginning of chapter one in the story. And uh, it is, they have gone through a terrible time, okay? So Naomi, she um, is an Israelite, one of God's chosen people, right? And she went, um, they had to go to Moab. She and her husband and two sons had to leave Bethlehem and go to Moab because there was a famine in the land. And sometimes we just skip over that, like da 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 da. But they were in that desperate of a situation. So they were literally starving. And so they had to go to this city, to Moab. Moab was a place that were not God's chosen people. Moab was a place where um, some theologians say that they, they were um, sacrificing children to their gods. Um, it was not a place that any Israelite wanted to go and live. And yet, um, Naomi had to go with her husband and her two sons to live in this place and uh, during this terrible time of famine. While she was there, her two sons were married, and neither of them were able to have kids um, during the whole time that they were there. Um, and so uh, that is a problem in the Israelite culture because they wanted to have children to continue their lineage and their heritage and then Naomi's husband dies. So to be a widow during that part of the world, I mean, if we look at, I was reading some stories even now um, in present day about women in India who have to, who go to one of the, the main cities there and beg for food if they become a widow because basically their status and stature in life is completely taken away um, if they lose their husband. And so that still happens. The way that the culture was in biblical times is still happening in our world today. It's removed from us. So we don't see it as much. Um, but it gives us kind of an idea and breaks our heart for what they must be going through. Okay. And so Naomi lost her husband and then her two sons died. So, I mean, it's like, oh, man, right at the beginning of this story, we've got tragedy and destruction and what in the world is happening? This is not the kind of story that, you know, I really want to read. And um, that's one of the things about God's word is he doesn't shy away and pretend that everything, if you're following God's plan and you are following his will, he doesn't ever pretend or uh, um, that everything is going to make sense. Okay, that's a good lesson to learn when we read the Bible. There are going to be some things that happen this side of eternity that we're not going to understand. And God does not shy away from from that. And you know what? So if we're followers of Jesus and you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, you don't have to shy away from that either. There are going to be some things that we don't understand. And when we get to heaven, we can ask God why those things happened. But we've got to come to terms with that and find a way that we can trust him in the middle of it, right? But the Bible is not scared to talk about those things. It talks about them over and over again, about difficult situations, which God knew that we would all be facing. And it gives us things that we can learn about how to go through difficult situations, right? So we have these, these two women. Um, so say Naomi's there. Ruth is her daughter-in-law. She's one of the daughter-in-laws, right? And now she's lost her husband. She's lost her two sons. And these three women, the two daughter-in-laws and Naomi, are walking back toward Bethlehem because there's still not enough food for anyone, right? It's still during a time of famine. And uh, she tells them on the road, you know what? You guys go back. Go back to your own um, country. Go back to Moab. You'll have a better chance of remarrying. Maybe there's a chance that you wouldn't have to live in extreme poverty. But if you go back to Israel as a Moabite woman, there's no chance that you'll be able to get married again. You're basically signing your, your death sentence to live out the rest of your life in poverty with me. And one of the daughter-in-laws, Orpah, she's like, awesome, peace out. I'm gone back to, you know, thank you for this opportunity. And, um, but Ruth says something that I think is one of the most uh, powerful scriptures in all of the entire Bible. And it is in Ruth 1, verse 16. And this is how Ruth replied to Naomi. She said, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. 
she makes this pledge there. It's, it, she has made a pledge to the living God. She has turned away from the gods that her ancestors worshipped and said, Man, I am on the path. I'm going to do everything to follow God. She goes on to say, where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. And so um, this beautiful promise that Ruth makes to her mother-in-law to go back. And so these two women... The, the characters of the story go back into Bethlehem. And something that was very telling to me when I was studying this and going through a, that difficult time um, was in verse 20. Um, when Naomi comes into town, when she walks into Bethlehem, the, uh, her friends say, is that Naomi? Like they don't even recognize her. I wonder if she wasn't so gaunt, so, so drawn, so hurting that she wasn't even recognizable. And do you know what she says to them? She says, don't call me Naomi. Okay, Naomi, that word means pleasant. Don't call me pleasant, she told them. Call me Mara. The word Mara means bitter. So she's saying, don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter because the almighty God has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me, and the Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So this is a really important thing for us to look at. Naomi's gone through a horrific, horrific ordeal of losing her husband and her sons and living during famine. And at this time she's decided that she's going to live out the rest of her days as a bitter woman. She makes that decision. She feels like that God has turned his back on her. Now, one great thing about Naomi, because we, you know, we kind of say, oh, she should have, you know, trusted God or whatever. One great thing is she did not turn her back on God. She did not walk away from him. But she felt like in God's silence that he had turned his back on her. And that's the story that she told herself. That's what she believed. And it made her in her heart and in her appearance bitter. And so she's someone that we need to look at when we're going through a difficult time. And God really used her story to impact me and say, Lord, please, don't let my heart get that way. Please don't let my heart be bitter. Help me to work through these emotions and help me to, to deal with it, um, to talk through it with other people so that I won't become bitter like that. And so we, um, we look at these women and we see how God's created them. And in, the, in chapter 2, um, they're going, in, they're, they're now living in Bethlehem and they're trying to figure out a way to have, to have food to eat. And one of the laws of the Israelite times was it, if you were a widow or you were ha having extreme poverty, that you could do what's called gleaning. And after they were harvesting the grain, you could stand at the back and pick up the little scraps that were dropped over and left behind, okay? That's, that's what gleaning was. It talks about that in chapter 2. Um, uh, Ruth was in the category where she would have been the third in line of the gleaners, okay? The first in line would be the workers. They got to pick up stuff to take home extra for their family, but she was all the way at the back of the line. So that first day, she's there, and she is working. Like, you can imagine. She's out there. It's dangerous for a woman to be out there with all the men and gathering, and everybody's trying to get their fair um, place. And I think um, Ruth and Naomi break a lot of the stereotypes that we have about women, right? Like I think, especially in the church, it's like women are very um, mild and demure and, you know, so proper. And then, man, we look at Ruth with her sleeves rolled up and out there sweating and working and being in industrious. And, and that just breaks that, that mold altogether. I came across this um, speech 
that an African-American slave did in the 1800s. Her name um, is Sojourner Truth. And she was talking about the plight of women in the world during her time. And I think it's very similar um, to Ruth and to how she must have felt being um, in that context at that time. So I wanted to read just a couple of lines of Sojourner's Truth's, po uh, her speech that she made at a women's rights convention, okay? She said, uh, she said, uh, that man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles or gives me any best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man. And ain't I a woman? I've borne 13 children, seen most sold off to slavery. And when I cried out in my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? I'd say, yeah, she is. Come on. Like that, no matter what society is telling us, no matter what box we try to put on things, God has this, this um, tenacity, this warrior-like ability that comes out in women to survive and to thrive during difficult times. And I see that in Ruth, that same, like, getting out there. You know what she did after uh, that, during that first day of gleaning? She went up to the landowner, okay, this wealthy and powerful man whose name was Boaz. We'll talk more about him in a minute. Um, and she said, hey, is it okay if I glean from your field? And this was um, a question that was... Um, had a little bit of nuance in it because it was, of course, okay for her to glean from the field because every woman had the right to do, everybody had the right to do that. That was the law. But what she was saying is basically, can I go to the front of the line with the workers to glean the field and will you watch over me to make sure no one attacks me? And he said, you know what? You are a woman of valor because of what you're doing for your mother-in-law. I've heard about you. I know you have pledged yourself to her and your reput reputation precedes you because of what you're doing for your mother-in-law. And so, yes, bless you for what you're doing and I will allow you to do that. And so you can imagine when Ruth came home that day, she had so much grain. And one of the things that several um, commentaries talk about is that both of these women were probably in the middle of a severe depression. They had lost their husband, uh, sons, they were in the middle of a very difficult time. And so um, just what we know about the loss of a loved one, how the hormonal changes that follow, they're saying there was a high chance that they were both very depressed. And so you think about Naomi waiting at home all day long. She was too old to be able to go out and help, so she's just waiting. Was Ruth safe? Was she going to be okay? Were they going to have food? I bet she was so hungry. And Ruth comes home to her, and she is carrying so much grain. Because of her boldness to ask Boaz to go to the front of the line, she had, and because of God's favor on her, she had 15 times the amount of grain that what I any one person would have had. It was the equivalent of like half a year's wages. So it was this amazing celebration when she got home because it was like, oh, Man, have you ever had that moment where you've been in like a really difficult season and you, ha you this something happens that you can't explain in any other way and it starts to give you like a little ray of hope, of sunshine, that maybe God is who he says he is, that maybe he is going to come through, that maybe he hasn't forgotten about me, that maybe he does still see me. And um, Naomi has this outburst where she says, oh, Bless this man who, who gave us the food. This is, this is amazing. And she realizes that God still sees her. 
And so just that glimpse of provision. But they still had a lot of things that they needed, these two ladies. They still had a lot of needs. And I'm going to let you um, read the chapters 3 and 4 on your own. You're going to see this um, a little bit of a scandalous love story with Boaz and Ruth as they, um, uh, as they get married. And um, during that time, we can see a great parallel between um, Boaz who comes um, as, as a, what, what the Bible calls a kinsman redeemer. And it's the same idea as how Jesus has come for us. Um, but Ruth and Naomi were so strong in their own right. Um, one other observation that I had in this was that um, many times in our world today, um, and I'm aware of this because I consider myself to be a strong woman and I was raised by strong women. Um, there's this idea that if we are around men, that there's sort of a shrinking to that. Like that it, if, a, if a woman is strong, then a man can't be strong, right? And this book really shows us that that is not the case at all. Ruth and Naomi were strong women and Boaz was a strong man. He was a man of God. He was a man of valor. And they didn't, and them being big and them being strong did not take anything away from Boaz. And they were stronger warriors together than they were even apart. And so I think that's an amazing observation in looking at our culture today and, and the way that um, the world is. I think... Um, when we look at this story, we have to remind ourselves of, of, of just God's goodness. And one of the ways, um, one of the things that came to mind um, when we tell stories, we, we have to think about what's the story that we're telling ourselves about our life. Like if you had to sit down and write a story about what is my story, right? What is my story? How, how is it working out right now? And um, I had to do that. As an assignment, when I was in seminary, um, this was right uh, when Chris and I had first met. This was two months before we got married, okay? And the professor at seminary asked us to write out what, what it is, just the story of our life in a one-page poem, okay? That's a, that's a really hard thing to do if you've never done that. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting assignment. And the first thing that I wrote was like um, this really cookie cutter, syrupy, sweet thing that was just so much about how life was perfect and great and, you know, kind of like the ranch and all the stuff I was telling, you know, like, and, and I read it and I was just like, oh, that, I mean, I love that idea. And that was true of a part of my life, but that's not the whole picture of my life, right? And so I was like, okay, I'm going to, you know, try to deal with some of the, 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 the stuff, the, the dark stuff that we push to the side, right? And so then I wrote this horrible, dark, and depressing, and full of despair. I mean, like, it would just, if I had read that out loud in my seminary class, people would have just run out of the room. Like, it was so, but it was true. It was my life. It was things that had happened to me in my life. But I was like, there's got to be a better way to tell this. How, what is it? What, what is the truth, God? How does this work out in your plan? What is my story in the middle of that? So I wanted to read it for you today. Two months before Chris and I got married, okay? This is my story about home, okay? Home was a white house with a big backyard. We were little there swallowed by the shady tree, church all day Sunday and Wednesday nights, family dinners in the kitchen, not the dining room. My perfect purple room just next door to the safety of mom and dad, love and laughter filled the halls and spilled out into the house and onto the sidewalk. Home was happy. Home was a monstrosity of a mansion carved wooden doors, splintering and cracking, filled with the abnormal, a stagecoach, bare rug, hummingbirds, scary stepdad, fistfights, 
broken mother. Everything that money could buy, but no happiness in the hall. Only empty space and tears. Home was hollow. Home was on the ranch where Mimi and Grandale raised cattle and us. Fields vast enough to lose yourself and your past. Love enough to reconcile wrongs. Softest, warmest beds with the best sleep. Sweet memories and smiles picture the halls that have always been there. Home was healing. Home is up in the air right now. We looked at a place last night. It's small and stale, but it's got potential. It's a perfect place for newlyweds. No halls, just two rooms connecting, filled any way that we want. Together, making a new family full of promise. Home is hope. And I think when every single one of us is thinking about what is our story, what is the story that God's writing in my life right now in this moment, if we can hold on to that word hope, it will make all the difference to give us perspective. I've tattooed it on my arm so I can remember that word. On this side of eternity, hope is what we have to hold on to, that whatever it is that we've gone through, that there's a purpose for it. Even if we don't understand it until way later, God is working to redeem and to restore all things for his glory and for his good. And so we, he writes the best stories, and we can hope and trust in him in those stories. Um, a few of the things that we see, especially with how Ruth responded, um, that made a difference in the middle of her story that we can learn from is that um, even in the midst of difficulty, it's, it's so important to keep and continue thinking about someone else. It gave her a hope and a purpose to want to help Naomi, right? It gave her a hope. Um, it gave her a purpose every day. And pain is one of the things that is... Um, uh, is one of the things that makes us turn inward more than anything else. And the problem with that is that there's no comfort in pain. And so if you've come here today, I know that Mother's Day is not a happy day for everyone. It's a difficult day for some people. And if you've come here today and that's you, I just want um, for you to know that we've prayed for you and that God, uh, we prayed that he would comfort you, that we, he would meet you right where you are. If you're a mom today who's struggling, who is um, having a really hard time, we've prayed that God will draw near to you, that you will feel his comfort and his presence in this place. Um, as we look at um, these things and as we turn and focus to be with other people, just to be here in the middle of community today, to come alongside other people and to celebrate and to um, share joy that in itself can take our eyes off of our pain and onto other people. And there are really great tangible ways um, that we can do that. We can reorient our thoughts to a purpose that is bigger than ourselves. We can realize that God's purpose is bigger and that even if we don't understand it right now, we can trust him. I think following God with our whole hearts is another thing that I would encourage you to do, that whatever you do, that you would set your eyes on it and that you would set out on that road um, filled with hope and filled with purpose because God has made each one of us with a purpose. There's a song um, that I've been listening to um, that the words of this song um, – are so perfect. It's reminded me of how God is continuing to shape my story in my own life. And so I wanted to sing it today. And um, I think during this time, if you're wrestling with some things, I hope that you'll take the time to just bow your head and pray and ask God to help you see your story in a little bit of the way that, that, that he sees your story. And that if you can't see it enough to see any good in it, that he, that he would give you the ability to trust in him. 
uh, to trust that his plan is the best plan. At the end of the book of Ruth in chapter 4, we see this amazing conclusion of the story. And um, uh, I'm, I'm going to read I'm going to read this one verse. I think I have it up there on the screen um, where it, it says um, that Ruth had a son. She had a son um, with Boaz after they got married. And it says uh, in verse 14 of chapter 4, um, Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons. Isn't that great? Yeah. Has given him birth. And Naomi took that child and laid him in her lap and she cared for him. Oh, isn't that amazing? And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse. And then Jesse was the father of David. David, who became the second king of Israel. David, who is in the lineage of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was born to us by a Moabite woman who was barren for 10 years and who God restored completely in a miraculous way to be in the lineage of Jesus Christ himself. I mean, if that's not a great story, I don't know what is. Listen to this next song and um, just, just pray um, that God would speak to you through these words. There is no good thing that you withhold. You write a beautiful story. You write a beautiful story. From glory to glory, I believe it. You write a beautiful story. You write a beautiful story. And ending, and in between, I would have let go had you not reached out and silenced all my doubt with hope. You pull me close and tell my heart to rest, cause you know what is best, yes, and you're. You write a beautiful story, you write a beautiful story, from glory to glory, I believe it. You write a beautiful story, you write a beautiful story, beginning and ending, and in between, all the while you keep saying trust that i am orchestrating everything for good all the while you keep saying trust that i am custom making everything for good you work all things together for good all things together for good all things together for good like you said you would you work all things together for good all things together for good all things together for good like you said you would you write a beautiful story you 
to glory. I believe it. You write a beautiful story. You write a beautiful story. Beginning and ending and in between. All things together for good. All things together for good. All things together for good. You work all things together for good, all things together for good, all things together for good, like you said you would. Can we just sing this part together? It's, um, you write a beautiful story. Let's sing it together. Just lift your voice and sing it out. Story, you write a beautiful story from glory to glory. I believe you write a beautiful story, you write a beautiful story, beginning, ending, and in between. Dear God, we come before you this morning and we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that the story that you're writing in each one of our lives is unique and it is beautiful and it is good. God, I thank you for these two powerful and amazing women, Ruth and Naomi, and how you have shown their story to us so that we might um, have hope in the midst of our story, that we might have direction, that we might know that we can turn to you, Father, that we can look to you, that we can make decisions to see our story in the best light, in the way that you see it, Father, that we can trust in you, that we can hope in you. And I thank you for these women who are here today, these, these Azer warriors, Father, I pray that you would help them to rise up in the high calling that you have given to us as women, that we would put our shoulders back and our heads up, Father, and that we would come alongside you in making your name known for your plans and for your focuses, that we would know that we are made warriors by you, Father. Help our strength to come from you. I pray that you would renew and replenish us today. We thank you that you are working all things for good. We trust in you, Father. We love you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.